seeking for fortune and fame. I had nothing but doubts and confusion. But now I have everything, everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus and He is the way. He has saved me and He gave me life eternal and now I have everything I was making big plans for my future I had lived my lifetime in vain then I prayed for life's only meaning and now I have everything everything I need to make me happy I have Jesus and He is the way saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have everything he has saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have That's a true statement, isn't it? We have everything in the Lord Jesus Christ, and without Him we have nothing. Nothing worth having anyway. Nothing, surely nothing eternal without the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your place in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 18, I'm going to begin reading here in just a moment in verse number 28. Verse number 28 is where I'll begin reading here. Let me just say that uh, before we get into the reading of the scripture, that in the second chapter of the book of, uh, or excuse me, in the 18th chapter of the second book of Chronicles, we have for us uh, some interesting characters. Uh, we have the story of two kings here. We have uh, in this chapter, we'll find the king of Israel. And he was a wicked man, wicked king, and had a wicked wife. His name was Ahab, and his wife's name was Jezebel. And uh, they were wicked people. Did not follow the Lord in any way, size, shape, or form. We also find in the 18th chapter the story of the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And his name was Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. Uh, but he got put under a lot of pressure. Now, beginning in the first part of the 18th chapter, you don't need to turn back, I'm not going to read it, I just want to explain that in the beginning of the chapter, we find that there is an alliance being made between the king of, uh, king of Israel, Ahab, and the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. The Bible doesn't call it an alliance, it actually calls it an affinity. And uh, this affinity uh, was an alliance but it was a special kind of an alliance. It wasn't a political one. It wasn't a governmental one. It wasn't a military one. It was an alliance that brought them together because of a marriage. Uh, the daughter of Ahab was given to the son of Jehoshaphat to wed. And so when they got married, that made, made the king of the north, uh, the king of Israel, Ahab, and the king of the south, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, made them in-laws. Ahab tried to use that to his advantage in a situation that happened here in the 18th chapter of the book of 2 Chronicles. He tried to use that relationship, this new affinity, this new in-law relationship, 
to try and to force and actually to put in danger and to put in harm's way Jehoshaphat, the king of the southern kingdom. And so uh, after the marriage has taken place and they've uh, formed this affinity, now they're, they're in-laws, King Ahab approaches Jehoshaphat one day and he said, Hey, I want you to do something for me. You won't find in the Word of God, he says, that you owe me, but uh, you can read between the lines and figure out that Ahab's trying to put a little pressure on Jehoshaphat to do this favor. He said, well, what is it you want me to do? He said, I want you to gather the armies of the southern kingdom. And I want you to go with me in the armies of the northern kingdom. And we're going to go up, way up to the northeast. And we're going to engage in battle against King Ben-Hadon and the Syrian army. Now the place that he wanted to go was a place called Ramoth-Gilead. And Ramoth-Gilead was a little over... 50 miles away from the northern kingdom's capital of Samaria and uh, probably closer to 75 to 100 miles away from the southern kingdom's capital of Jerusalem. And so Jehoshaphat agreed that he would do that and so they, they make this alliance and they agree to go. Now Ramoth Gilead is a, is a little place on the map it's way up in the northeastern corner of Israel. It's, uh, it lies right on the eastern border of Israel and the border with Syria. It's very close to the border of Syria. And it lies in the, in the land of Gad, so one of the sons of, of uh, Jacob. And so they go up there and they decide to go do the battle. Now we come down to verse number 28 of the 18th chapter. And uh, as we see them getting ready to go, uh, they've joined themselves together, and we pick up on uh, the action here, beginning in verse 28. And the Bible says, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth-Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went to the battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, now listen to this, fight ye not with small or great, save only the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out. And the Lord helped him. And God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. That means that he wasn't aiming at anything. He, he just took a... The, the battle is, is, is so uh, involved right now that he's not aiming at any particular target. He just reaches back, gets an arrow out of his quiver, puts it in the bow and just pulls back and lets it fly. And he has no idea where it's going. And so the Bible says that that certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thine hand that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. And about the time of the sun going down, he died. Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, had a plan in mind that he was going to go out and he was going to get a great victory 
uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel and he was going to defeat the Syrian army. Now he was going to have to cheat a little bit in order to do that, but he had a plan. He thought it was a good plan. Now he evidently had some information that he had gotten perhaps by spies or uh, whatever the case may be. Perhaps uh, perhaps uh, one of his men had infiltrated the Syrian army and uh, got some information and brought it back because it's just too coincidental that the scripture says that the king of Syria had given a command that the only one I want you to go after today is Ahab. The king of Israel, that's the only one I want you to go after today. And Ahab told Jehoshaphat, he says, now when we get up to the battlefield, you put on all your kingly robes like you're supposed to, but I'm going to disguise myself. I'm going to dress up perhaps just like a common soldier. I'm I'm not going to reveal my true identity. I'm just going to pretend to be something that I'm not because I want my life spared. Now, he could care less about Jehoshaphat's life. He made him, he put a target on his back. But the Bible says that when the Syrians started surrounding Jehoshaphat's chariot, he cried out to God and God helped him and, and let the Syrian army know right quick, I'm not Ahab, I'm Jehoshaphat. And they all fled away. Then the Bible tells us in verse 33 that that certain man, we don't know who he was. It's not important that we know who he was. But God used that man that day and he pulled that arrow out of that quiver, put it in that bow and drew it back and let that arrow fly. And just as I believe with all of my heart that God grabbed the rock out of David's sling and slammed it into the forehead of Goliath, I believe God grabbed that arrow when it got airborne and rammed it right between the joints of the harness. I mean right through the heart of the king of Israel. And the Bible says that he told his chariot man to turn and, and get me off this battlefield for I'm wounded. But the Bible says they didn't go right away because it says that the battle increased that day. It got hotter and hotter a battle and, and somehow, some way, through his own strength, Ahab stayed up in this chariot. But my text is in verse 34, and it says, And about the time of the sun going down, he died. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning, and I, I want to ask you a question. Where will you be standing when the sun goes down? Where will you be standing when the sun goes down? I could say, what will you be standing on when the sun goes down? Now that we have an understanding of this, uh, of this uh, story, there's a couple of things that I want to add to help you understand what happened that day. I want you to know that first of all, that King Ahab, uh, his death on that battlefield was not an accident. And it wasn't by happenstance. I believe it was in the will of God that Ahab died that day. God knew what was going on. God knew what was in Ahab's heart. And God put an end to it. I want you to know that on the day that Ahab went out to that battlefield, that he went out to that battlefield under a sentence of condemnation. He was already a condemned man. Now this story that I read to you in 2 Chronicles is also recorded for us in the book of 1 Kings. The 22nd chapter. But in the 21st chapter of 1 Kings, we have another story about a man named Naboth who had a vineyard hard against the palace of Ahab, the king of Israel. And Ahab wanted that vineyard, that garden. He wanted, he wanted it for his own. He wanted to plant a vegetable garden there. Whatever his, whatever his reasoning was, he, he wanted Naboth's land, and he wanted it so bad that he went out, Jezebel did anyway, went out and hired false witnesses 
to come to court and to give a false witness, to lie against Naboth, who was a godly man, and make all kind of accusations and charges against him and witnesses against him. And poor old Naboth had nobody to stand for him. So when the judgment was handed down, Naboth was ordered to be stoned, an innocent man. He hadn't done a thing wrong. Naboth had got, uh, Ahab had gone to him and said, Naboth, I want your vineyard. I want this piece of land. I'll pay you for it. I'll trade you for it, whatever the case may be. And Naboth said, God forbid, I can't give you the inheritance of my fathers. And so they had him killed. Well, the prophet of God came to Jezebel and to Naboth and in 1 Kings chapter number 21 and verse 19, we see this sentence of condemnation that God brought down upon the king of Israel, Ahab. Thus saith the Lord, hast thou killed and also taken possession? Thus saith the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood even thine. And that sentence was put against Ahab and against his wife Jezebel. I don't know whether or not he thought about that that day that he decided to go out and fight the Syrian army. That day he thought he was so wise and so smart in his own intelligence and in his own flesh that he was going to go out and win a great victory. But the first king's reckoning of this story in chapter 22 Verses 37 and 38 say, So the king died, speaking of Ahab, and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according to the word of the Lord, which he spake. God's prophecy, God's word of condemnation came true, didn't it? Ahab could not escape the inevitable. Ahab could not escape the sentence that God had put him under. I want you to know that you and I, as human beings, are under a sentence of condemnation. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And our father Adam put us into sin and made us depraved before God by his disobedience in the garden. Now Hebrews 9.27 is our condemnation, and then it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. Every one of us in here today, unless we live unto the coming of the Lord, we're going to die. I don't especially look forward to the prospect of it, but I cannot avoid it. It's unavoidable. It's going to happen. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Ahab could not accept the fact that he was going to die. Rather, he tried to do everything he could. Rather than preparing to die, he did everything he could and it gave all of his energy and all his efforts to trying to avoid the inevitable. And when his time to die came, he was standing on nothing of eternal value. Nothing that could help him. Not only did he go out to the battlefield under a sentence of condemnation, but he also went out to the battlefield ignoring the word of God's man, Micaiah. Ahab had brought about 400 of his prophets in, said, tell me boys, is it all right for me to go to Ramoth Gilead and to fight the Syrians and all 400 of them scared to death of the king, scared they would be executed if they didn't give the right uh, answer, said, yeah, you go on up there, king, and boy, God will put them in your hand and you'll win a great victory. Now, Ahab's feeling pretty good about himself. But before they leave to head out to the battlefield, Jehoshaphat speaks up. 
Jehoshaphat's a godly king, a godly man. And he said, Ahab, don't, don't you think that perhaps maybe instead of just getting your own men to tell you what you want to hear, maybe we need to go get a real prophet of God and let's hear what God has to say about it. Well, all right. Who, who are you going to bring in here? Well, I'm, I'm going to call for Micaiah. Well, I don't like him. He never says anything good about me. He never gives me a good prophecy. Everything he ever says about me is, is against me. I don't like him. But if you insist, bring him on in here. And at first, old Micaiah is kind of sarcastic to the king. He said, yeah, go ahead up there. Men, all of us men that are married, you have all learned, like I have, no disrespect against our wives. But when we want to do something and we go to our wife and talk about it and the first words out of her mouth are, go ahead, that is not permission. <laughs> Amen? That is not permission. Go ahead means you better back up and reconsider your decision. And so Micaiah, you know, said, go ahead. Yeah, go on up there and fight him. Yeah, you'll, go, yeah, you'll have a great victory. And then he, he backs off. He, he says, seriously, king, he said, I, I've done met with the Lord about this. And this is what the Lord told me to tell you because I, I'm come to tell you what God's told me. He said, if you go up there, he said, I have already been shown by God that you and the nation of Israel shall be scattered like sheep with no shepherd. You're going to be overrun. You're going to be defeated. Ahab said, see, I told you he don't ever give a good prophet. Get that man, Micaiah, and go throw him in prison. That's what they did. So he's under a sentence of condemnation. He's also under, under a, a, a rebellion against the message from God of what God told him not to do. He's going to go do it anyway. I can handle it. I got this covered, he thinks. So many people like that are going through their life under a sentence of condemnation. They're standing on things in their life that they think will get them to heaven someday. They think that they're doing all right, that they can make it through life all right. But the text says that at the time of the sun going down is when he died. You know, God created the sun. God created light. And God created light not just to provide light, but He provided light to sustain life. If it wasn't for our sun, we'd freeze to death. If our axis was tilted even a degree or two more, we'd either burn up or freeze to death. God's got us positioned exactly right between us and the sun. The Bible says that when the sun was going down, he died. Ahab died when the sun was literally going down. But him dying as the sun was going down also was symbolic in that the sun of his life was setting. And when the sun went down, his life was over. So where will you be standing? when the sun goes down on you? Where will you? What will you be standing on when the sun goes down on you? Well, let me use Ahab here for just a moment as an example of what not to stand on as you face the going down of the sun in your life. We find in verse number 28, first of all, that Ahab was standing on his authority to win the battle. He was the king. He was over all of the army. You don't go after the king. The king just stands back and directs the events of the army. You're not, uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, be, be killed in this battle because of who I am. Many people are living their life today 
uh, thinking that they're the master of their own destiny and that uh, they're the controller of their own future and that they've made their plans and uh, they talk about how I make my money and I go to my job and this is my car and this is my house and, and this is my boat and this is my bank account and my, 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 I'm all right and nobody can take those things away from me because they're mine. My name is on them. You can lose everything you have before we leave this church today. Did you know that? Everything you have, materially speaking, could be gone before this day is over. Then where are you going to be standing? What are you going to stand on then? What are you going to count on to bring you happiness then? What are you going to count on then to gain you an entrance into heaven? The Bible tells us that he was the king. So he depended upon his authority. But then the Bible tells us secondly that when he got out to the battlefield that he was standing on his disguise to try to protect him. His authority wouldn't save him. Perhaps his disguise would protect him. So many people today are living that kind of a life. They're trying to be something that they're not. They're trying to act like something that they're not. And let me tell you what, you can come in the church house and have on the prettiest clothes and, and have the finest hairdo and, and be carrying the finest, uh, finest uh, Bible under your arm with uh, the finest covered in the finest leather and drive a fine automobile and look like the best Christian. But God sees the devil in your heart. God sees the sin in your home. God sees the sin in your life. God sees you for what you really are. Ahab got information that they're after the king today, so I'm going to disguise myself and I'm going to act like something that I'm not and no one will come after me. I will be safe. And let me tell you something, every man on that battlefield except Jehoshaphat may have known, uh, may have thought, that the king was Jehoshaphat and that, the, that, that Ahab was just some soldier out there and nobody paid attention to him, but God saw him. And God knew he was acting like something that he wasn't. God knew his heart wasn't right. God knew, God knew exactly what he was doing. That's why I said when that gentleman reared back with that arrow and just let it go, I believe God grabbed it and rammed it right in the heart of Ahab. You can't hide from God. Your disguise won't protect you. Your authority won't save you. And then he tried to just disappear into the crowd. That's what people like to do. I've, I've, heard, I've heard people say that. They love going to great big churches because they get lost in the crowd and they're never asked to do anything. They're never called upon you know, nobody ever calls on to ask them to pray. Nobody asks them to take up the offering. Nobody asks them to do anything. They just kind of go and disappear into the crowd. They don't want to be seen. They really don't want to be there. And they really don't want anybody knowing that they're there. And Ahab tried to do that. Ahab tried to be obscure by hiding himself but his obscurity wouldn't hide him. No more than his authority would protect him and no more would his disguise save him from death. But then lastly, he did something that most people try to do when it comes between them and God. He tried to stand on his own strength. The Bible says that after he had disguised himself and after he was out in the battlefield and, and uh, the Bible says that that man drew a bow at a venture and hit him right between the joints of the harness. I mean, that hit him right in the center of the chest. He told his chariot man, said, turn around and get me out of here, I'm wounded. But the battle increased and the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until even. He tried to go along in his own strength, still trying to make it his own way. But when the sun went down, he died. So his 
self-authority, his disguise, his obscurity, his own strength. None of those things saved him or protected him or hid him or sustained him. And when the sun was going down, he died. So now it's time to consider our own situation. Would you consider for just a moment, where will you be standing when the sun goes down on your sound mind? I watched a daddy and a mom-in-law wither away to nothing completely having lost all of their cognitive, of cognitive ability. They could no longer reason. They could no longer understand. They didn't know who anyone was. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know anything that was going on around about them. They went from being able to critically think and to move and live to having someone totally care for them just like when they came into the world. When your mind is gone and you can no longer reason and you can no longer decide and you can no longer critically think, that's a, that's a little bit too late to decide, well, I think I need to be saved. My dad was one of the most brilliant men I ever knew. Him and my father-in-law. But my dad, when he come to die, he didn't know the first thing about what saved meant. We just thank God that he was. Consider yourself today. What are you standing on for eternity? What are you standing on? You want to go to heaven? I've never met anybody that said, yeah, I want to go to hell. What are you standing on to get there? Let me say to you that when the sun goes down on your sound mind, well, then it's a little bit too late. How about when the sun goes down on your good health and you're not able to go? Well, you'd like to. You know, one of the most, one of the most worst things that affects the human being it may not directly affect the mind, but indirectly it has a great effect on the way that we think and the way that we act. It's pain. Pain will wear you out. There's people in here in pain right now. Give about anything you got to get rid of that pain right now. When you're suffering... You'd think, well, why don't they get right with God? I mean, you know, they, they're suffering and hurting so bad. You, you hurt like they do and see if your mind's on God. Your mind's on relief. What are you going to be standing on when your health's gone? And then what are you going to be standing on when the sun of your life goes down and it's over? Well, Ahab stood on all the wrong things. He lived his whole life for the wrong world. He lived it for this one, not for the next one. But God has given us some things that you can stand on. When it comes to the sun going down in our life, we need to be found standing on the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's the blood of Christ that will erase your past. It's the blood of Christ that will cleanse your sins and wash them all away. The Bible speaks of the blood of Christ as being powerful blood and precious blood and peculiar blood and redeeming blood and cleansing blood and reconciling blood. The Bible says in Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I learned from listening to Dr. Seitler that that verse has three parts. For the life of the flesh is in the blood is a pure scientific fact. 
It's a fact of science. It doesn't have a bit of gospel in it. it. doesn't have a bit of salvation in it. doesn't have a bit of anything. It's just pure science. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You can go around and ask these nurses, these medical workers, who do this every day of the week. They'll tell you that's the truth, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood's made up of red cells and white cells and platelets and plasma and other things. Each one has its job. Those little red cells, boy, they run the nutrients and to your body and, well, they carry that oxygen around and they, move, uh, they remove that carbon dioxide that would kill you if it didn't get gone. Then when you get sick, more white cells, boy, they come out of dormant and, man, they jump on them bacteria and those viruses and they start protecting your body and trying to heal your body from within. You ought to thank God for them little platelets in your blood. Well, I tell you what, if you didn't have platelets in the blood, next time you nicked yourself, you'd bleed to death. Because they, 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 they what clot your blood, make scabs for you. Of course, we thank God for the plasma, the liquid that carries all of these things throughout our body every day, every day circulating through our body. We never give it a second thought. But we're fearfully and wonderfully made by God and the life of the flesh is in the blood. Not in the breath, not in the brain, but in the blood. It's a pure fact of science. Then he told us in that verse in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The second part, he says, and I have given it to you upon the altar. There's no gospel in that. There's no salvation in that. That's a pure fact of history. Pure fact of history. You could go ask any Orthodox Jew who denies the fact that Jesus Christ is God's Messiah. The Orthodox Jews still waiting on the Messiah to come, they think. And, but you go to them today and say, hey, is it really true that 2,000 years ago a man named Jesus Christ uh, was uh, brought to the Roman government by the uh, Sanhedrin Council and the Pharisees and uh, did this uh, Roman governor Pilate really convict him? And did they really crucify this man named Jesus? He'll say yes. If they're honest, they'll say yes, that really happened. That's a, that is a true historical fact. A man named Jesus died. The last part of that verse says, For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And that's a pure fact of theology. Therein is salvation. Therein is the gospel. For you see, your life is in your blood. And it was shed for you on the cross by Jesus Christ. But what you need to stand on is the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ will take your sins away. Depend upon Him. Lean upon Him. Call upon Him to have mercy upon your soul and to take your sins away. You see, the Roman cross became an altar where my great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, made the final sacrifice for the sins of the world through his blood. And his blood didn't cover my sins for a year like the atonement of the old covenant. His blood takes my sins away. Hallelujah to the Lamb forever. We need to stand on the blood. You trust in the blood. When the sun goes down on your life, the only thing we can say is in my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I hope that's the case for you today. I hope not only that you're standing on the blood of Christ, but I hope you're standing on the word of God. Because just as the blood erases my past, the word of God guides my future. Or guides my present. It guides me through my life now. It's the authority for us in all matters of faith and practice. God has honored His Word above all of His name. And God has chosen His Word to be the judge of all mankind. It's everything I need now and everything that I'll need for life eternal. You can trust this Word of God. You need to not only be standing on the blood and on the Bible, but you also need to stand on the blessed hope. Because this blessed hope secures my future. 
Jesus is coming again, the Bible says. And the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and is pictured in Revelation chapter number 4 uh, that this return of Christ for the believer will happen very quick. There will, be no, there will be no opportunity to go run outside and say, well, this looks like it's it. Now, Lord, I want you to forgive me of my sins and save me. It won't, it'll be quick. And that's taught throughout the Word of God. It's going to be quick. But it's also taught that it's going to be joyous. Man, what a homecoming day. Think of, think of it. If we live to the coming of Jesus and we don't go through the grave, we don't die, when we see our loved ones again for the first time since they left this world, it'll be in the cloud when we see Jesus. Now, man, what a joyous occasion that will be. But not only will it be quick and not only will it be joyous, but it will also be missed by all who have not trusted Christ. What are you standing on? What are you leaning upon for your eternity? Ahab leaned on the wrong things. He had nothing to stand on. And when he come to die that day in the floor of that chariot, that arrow stuck through his heart. The mighty king of Israel dropped into hell with nothing to stand on. His greatness, his authority, his might, his great military mind, his great strategic mind, all of that for naught. And now he's burning in hell just like the lowliest sinner that the world never heard of. Would you stand together for me for just a moment? Sammy, you and Scott can come. If you're saved this morning and you know it, say amen. Then why don't you join in this little chorus with me and then we'll let them do their invitation. Let's sing together, would you, with me? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Father, in Jesus' name Thank you, Lord, for reaching back in the Old Testament and showing us the power of the blood and the book and the blessed hope. That these are the things that we need to stand upon. Not our authority, not our greatness or might. Certainly not trying to live and being something that we're not. Not trying to get lost in a crowd to have our way. But Lord, you have shown us the things to stand upon. And our own strength won't help us. Our Father, this morning I invite those that are among us today, if they realize that they are unsaved, they've never trusted Christ. They've never heard of depending upon the blood of Jesus to wash those sins away. Perhaps they have religion. They've done some religious act. But Lord, you said it's the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. I pray that you would give them courage to step out and come to the altar this morning and receive Christ as their own personal Savior. And Lord, I pray for the born-again ones that are here today that know what they're standing on. Perhaps they have a burden in their heart for a friend, a loved one, a co-worker that has nothing to stand upon. 
Lord, we pray that today they'll come and pray for that person. And Lord, dedicate themselves to doing all they can to win them to Christ. And if they have been doing that, Lord, revive them, revive their effort to lead that lost one to Christ. Have your will and way in this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.